Good evening. This is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is September 25th, 2000. And this evening we are pleased to have with us Alton Webb. Welcome and I think we call you Al, don't we? Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you, Al, it's good to have you with us tonight. Thank Can we you. start by um, my asking you how old you are? Yes, I'm uh, 57, John. Okay, and I'm instantly doing the math. You were born in 1942. Yes, it is. That's correct. <laughs> Good. And what is your current address? I, I live at the... To us here. Yes. Um, are you married? Yes, I'm married and have two children that are both married, a, a daughter and a, a son. They're both married? Yes. Uh, do you have grandchildren? No grandchildren, no. Okay. <laughs> well, that, that's going to be a blessing. <laughs> Where were you born now? Yes. I was born in uh, Waltham, Massachusetts, uh, at the Waltham Hospital, actually. Yes. And were you raised in that area? Y yes, I grew right up in Waltham all my life. And then I uh, came to Wayland in 1968, actually, uh, to work for the town of Wayland. Mm -hmm. And I worked there for thir thir over 30 years. Oh, uh, yes. what did you do there? I was uh, the town treasure collector for uh, the Wayland, uh, John, and, uh, and uh, I retired from the town after that many years of service mm -hmm. in uh, 1998, and since then just been doing part-time work. Okay, that sounds uh, like a good life. Yeah. You were born uh, uh, in 1942, right smack in the middle of uh, World War II. Um, was anybody in your family involved in that war? Uh, directly, my father was not uh, ever in the service, but he worked for a company in Waltham that made rivets uh, for the uh, mm -hmm. military, and that was the Judson Thompson Company. Okay, and did you grow up hearing stories about that war? People would tell you about a guy named Hitler or uh, the Normandy invasion, things like that. Was that part of your upbringing? Yeah, uh, yeah it was uh, partly somewhat. Uh, I had a very close cousin that was in the uh, Marine Corps that uh, actually was in about five different combats uh, uh, during the Second World War and uh, actually uh, came through it fine and became a, a lieutenant in the Waltham Fire Department after that. So. Okay. Uh, so yeah. that was part of your growing up then? It was. Uh, your dad worked in a place that made rivets? Yes. Was he some mm -hmm. kind of a, a mechanic or engineer? I actually did a lot of shipping type of shipping of uh, the rivets actually in the shipping department. Yeah. It was an old, old factory in Waltham and uh, they, uh, I think the uh, rivets were used somewhat uh, to do with military equipment, uh, John. I don't know exactly what... Uh, Okay. And, and what about your mother? Uh, my mother was actually a nurse, uh, a practical nurse. She also worked for a dentist for quite a few years and then uh, did this practical nursing and taking care of uh, elderly people that were uh, sick at home. And she but was home was she that. in any way involved in uh, wartime effort? No, she wasn't. No. No. She was a nurse for elderly yeah. people, you Just, say? Yes, she was. Yeah. Yes. Did I ask you if you mm -hmm. had brothers or sisters? Uh, no, you didn't, but I do have a sister that's uh, two years older than myself. Yeah, so she's, she's 59 years old? Yes. Yeah, yeah. She, born in uh, 1940. Uh, yes, yeah, okay. that's correct. Can you tell us what Waltham, what you remember it being like when you grew up, a kid in a town she, like that? Um, I, I do, uh, because they used to have a lot of wonderful parades in Waltham, and I remember uh, actually, a lot of the military were in the parades down there. They had the Legion Band that was uh, Dot Slam and that uh, really was the leader of the, of the band. She had done that for many, many years, just till recently. And oh, of course. She's, uh, she's yes. walked through Natick many, yes, many yes. a parade. Yeah. 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 And I had two nephews that were in the band, too, so, uh, the, over the past few years here. Uh, uh, within the last 10 or 15 years, they were both in the band. And uh, it was very nice because they got to travel quite a bit with, with the band it overseas. It was a very excellent band, as I remember. Oh, yeah, it was, yes. You went s through the, the whole Waltham school system, did grammar school and yes, uh, I into did. high school. Yes. So what, about what year did you get into high school? I think it would have been in 1956. 
56. Yes. yes. And is, that's when you entered it? Yes. Okay. And um, now you're here tonight because you were a veteran. Um, when did you get into the service? I actually uh, joined the uh, United States Marines Corps in uh, 1960, of January 1960, John. Joined the United States Marine Corps? Yes, I did. 1960. Yes. Why did you join the Marine Corps in 1960? Well, I guess, you know, even as I was growing up uh, uh, through my teenage years and that, I always felt uh, I knew a, uh, quite a bit about the Marines. I, I knew it was a very difficult, uh, or pretty uh, rugged outfit, uh, you know, uh, and uh, the history of the uh, Marines, I, I had read some about it, and uh, I wanted, uh, I felt that I needed some, uh, um, you know, good discipline, and, uh, and I knew I'd get it that way. It, it changed my life uh, uh, completely. Uh, uh, I think in, uh, even today, I, I look back, uh, and um, it, it was it was uh, uh, quite a, an experience, a great experience for me. Really, it was. Well, tell us about reading books and your interest in the Corps. Did you personally know any Marines? Uh, anybody in the Corps? The, the only, only my uh, cousin uh, that had served during the Second World War. Yeah. Uh, other than that, I really didn't know any others that I uh, can recall uh, in the Marine Corps. But uh, just uh, I think it was really just from hearing. I think at that time we had some. Maybe recruiters came into the school and that, mm -hmm. uh, and spoke to the some of the students and things like that. Uh, I had gone down at that time in Waltham on the on the common uh, were uh, the different uh, services. Uh, the Navy had a little small um, house there, a little shack sort of, and the Marine Corps did, and uh, also the Army as well. And I had gone down and talked to the recruiter several times about maybe going in. And um, so when I, in January of 1960, uh, I was able to um, leave in my senior year. If your grades were passing at that time, uh, you could leave in January of, of that school to year. To enter the service? Yes, you could. Yeah. Did leave. you talk to your cousin about uh, going into the Corps? Uh, I think I did. You know, we weren't really real close, but I had, I had spoken with him a bit. And, and did he and encourage you to do to, this? Uh, no, I don't think he did, to be honest with you. I don't think so. <laughs> but I, and then I had, I had an uncle that was in the Navy as well. Too. Okay, yes. so you're, you're bound for mm. Paris Island. But can you tell us about um, talking to your folks about, your, mm. I'm going to go into the Marine Corps. What was their reaction mm. to this? I, I think they were a little uh, skeptical about my going. Uh, they. Um, because they didn't want to see me leave. Naturally, they we were very close. We didn't have uh, it was just my sister and I, but but um, I was pretty persistent about going in, and so they gave me the support, and uh, and sure enough, off I went and uh, left from uh, Boston, South Station, Boston, on train there. And were you 17, 18, y yes, just uh, about 18? Yes, I was 17. Yes. <clears throat> And what, uh, for how long a period did you sign up? Uh, for four years. You were going to yes. do a whole hitch in the Marine Corps? Yes, I did. Yes. Okay. Now you're on a train at South Station. Were any other guys with you um, that, that you knew, or were you all by yourself? There, there was one other uh, fellow that uh, was graduated from Waltham High School at the same time, and I, I did know him uh, not really well, but we became good friends after we got in the service. Who was he? And his name was Melvin Brault. And Melvin and you got on that same train? Yes, we did. And you drove down through Washington and Virginia to, and yes. to the Carolinas. Yes. I take it you were sent to Paris Island? Yes, I was. Tell us about arriving at Paris yes. Island in 1960. Well, I, I, I recall that it was uh, kind of late in the day when we got down to a, a town called Yamasee. Uh, and we got off the train, and uh, I think even before we got off the train, we had uh, uh, the drill instructors or people telling us and yelling at us to get off the train. Uh, we stood right beside the tracks, and the next thing I knew, we had to go into a Quonset hut, and uh, they had us cleaning, uh, actually, uh, uh, the head there, the urinals and commodes, and 
and that was our first assignment, I guess. And uh, we just did what we were told, and and a lot of screaming went on. And uh, what what did they yell at you? I, I think they just said, uh, everybody off the train, get off the train. They didn't and, say you'll be uh, sorry. Uh, I'm sure they did probably say that, <laughs> say that too, but, <laughs> uh, but that was our uh, first uh, uh, initiation there. Uh, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was kind of dark. I remember getting on a, a bus. I, I don't recall if it was a Greyhound bus, but it was a bus heading out to Paris Island. And it was dark enough that you could see the, still see the Spanish moss and the trees. And the smell in the air smelled different, you know, from the, I think, from the trees. Yeah. Uh, you could so you're a 17-year-old yeah. kid. Yes. And, and you're now in Paris Island, your first night there, and getting all your gear. Can you remember what you felt like and uh, your, f you know, gee, maybe I made a mistake or this is going to be great? Sure. I, I, I was nervous and I, uh, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, I, you just didn't know what to expect. I, I know when we uh, got to Paris Island and we get, even before we got off the bus again, there were uh, people yelling at us to get off the bus, get, get in line, and, and then we all walked into a building there. and. Uh, uh, they had us actually sitting down, almost like uh, a, a school classroom, uh, and uh, we sat at desks, and they would uh, read out your name and the serial number, and you had to know that serial number right away, uh, so you memorized that, and so when you went forward up to, to speak to them, they would ask you some questions, uh, and, and we'd fill out some papers and so forth. Um, you had to know that number right away. And if you didn't know that number, boy, you were in trouble right away. So <laughs> you soon learned your serial number. And uh, what was yours, Al? Uh, my mine was one nine zero zero eight one nine. Yes. And of course, they would trick you by asking you later, as we went along through the uh, uh, twelve weeks or twelve thirteen weeks, I guess it was at Paris Island that, um, you know, they would try to trick you with your rifle number mm -hmm. and they'd say, ask you what your uh, rifle number was, you know, and uh, sometimes you'd say your serial number by mistake. <laughs> that didn't always work too well either. <laughs> Tell us more about uh, the kind of training you got. What did you do mostly at PI? Uh, well, I think the very beginning was mostly all, you know, uh, uh, between classroom work, you know, uh, uh, and sitting in classrooms, and, and uh, they would uh, instruct you on, uh, you know, various things, especially especially on uh, rifle uh, equipment. Uh, you had to know your rifle backwards and forwards. Uh, what it, kind of rifle did you it, have? It, it was an M1 that I. The Grand to, Rifle. Yes, it was. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and I had an eight-round clip that would go in that joint. Uh, and you had to be able to take that apart almost with your eyes closed and then put it back together. And uh, we would uh, spend hours on the rifle range, of course. Uh, but also uh, we trained for marching, you know. Uh, we did an awful lot of marching and physical fitness, you know, running. Uh, it didn't matter what the weather was, of course in January it was kind of cold. And uh, in Paris Island, as you know, uh, there's a lot of sand fleas come out somewhere along the way in the spring there. They made a whole and movie out of that. Too. Yes, they did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, you would get bit by those sand fleas, but you couldn't slap them at all. You couldn't move. Uh, otherwise, boy, the drill instructor would just go up and down you and, uh, you know, really chew you out, you know, if you tried to uh, slap those fleas. So everybody just stood and put up with it here really. And we found out that later, uh, by using the rifle oil that we had in the butt of our rifle, by putting that rifle oil on our faces, that seemed to help keep the uh, sand fleas off of us. We found that out, so we tried that. That That's was a, very clever. It seemed to work, yes. <laughs> Somewhere along here, you took a battery of tests. Uh, yes, they did. To find out what your interests were. Yes. And what the best use the core could make of you? Do you remember those? Yes, I sitting do. Sitting there and taking those. Yes, I do. Yes. So after I, um, mm. thirteen weeks or so, uh, they called you out one day and told you where you were going to go. Yes. As a result of that testing. That's right. Uh, was yes. this guy still with you, your friend uh, Melvin? Uh, 
uh, he had gone, um, I, I'm trying to think, I think after, camp, you know, we had gone to advanced training after Paris Island up to Camp Lejeune. At that point, I think he had gone to, uh, he did go to Cherry Point for a while, too. We were stationed at Cherry Point, North Carolina. But what, what was the, the day when they told you where you were going to go? Uh, uh, what, was, what, what did they tell you you were going to do in the Corps? I had my orders to, uh, after I uh, got through Paris Island, to uh, go up to Camp Lejeune. I went up there by bus, and uh, I had to report for advanced training up there. For actually, it was supposed to be. Uh, I think it was. Um, I'm trying to think. Of, uh, it must have been about a couple of months training that we had up at uh, Camp Lejeune. It was actually Camp Geiger, which is part of Camp Lejeune. But you were assigned to the Marine Corps to, Infantry then. Y yes, it and was. So you were sent up to North Carolina. Yes, it was. And um, mm -hmm. what did you think of that assignment? To uh, you know, uh, I it was a little re it was a relief to be out of Paris Island, you know, <laughs> and 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 it was uh, people that were called troop handles that. Uh, instead of dr drill instructors uh, uh, were in charge of you there. It was a little bit more freedom than at Paris Island. We didn't have any uh, liberty at Paris Island at all, but uh, only at night you would have maybe an hour or so to write letters home, uh, clean your, your boots, clean your rifle, and that was pretty much it. But up at um, uh, Camp Lejeune there, we had a little, more, a little bit more freedom. So on weekends, sometimes we have a little liberty to go into town. We, sometimes I would walk about four or five miles into Jacksonville, North Carolina, just for, the, just for something to do. I would call home, things like that. The assignment you got uh, in the Marine Corps Infantry, would you rather have done some, something else in the Corps? Yes. And was there any way you could uh, change that assignment? Could you sit down with somebody and say, look, I'd rather uh, fly or I'd rather swim or something else? Yes. Did uh, you do any of that? I did try that, yes. I, I was trying to get into com communications. Yeah. And uh, I got to, uh, uh, at one point, I was going to go to school up at Norfolk, Virginia for communications. I was able to talk to the gunnery sergeant that was in charge of our uh, unit there at, at Cherry Point. There, I worked out of a uh, hangar, and uh, it was we had C-119 planes. I was in supply aircraft supply, and we had C-119 aircraft, which are uh, real large. At that time, they were pretty large uh, uh, transport planes. And now, how, how did how did you mm. get to Cherry Point? Uh, well, once I once I finished my advanced training at Camp Lejeune. And I got orders to report to Cherry Point, but I did go home on Liberty for about a month after after I finished my advanced training at Camp Lejeune, and I was there about two, a couple of months. Uh, uh, I didn't I missed out on my graduation because uh, from high school because I had mess duty for a month at Camp Lejeune as well, and by the time I got back, it was uh, about six months later from the time I went in. So. It was probably July, I guess, by the time I get home. Oh, so you missed yes. your high school graduation. Yes, I did. Yes, yeah. Who, who came and yeah. got your uh, uh, certificate? Your, oh, your family came uh, Yes, my mother always said she was going to help me, she, you know, uh, get my diploma because uh, she had helped me through uh, school, you know, uh, studying and everything. She was wonderful. And, and uh, she kept saying, I'm going to get your diploma one of these days, and sure enough, uh, it turned out that way because she, she ended up going up uh, at the Embassy Theater in Waltham, and uh, Mayor Rose at the time presented her with my high school diploma, uh, and, uh, and that was uh, in 1960, it would have been. So, uh, so uh, I had missed out on all the uh, kind of the fun of my graduation, unfortunately. <laughs> well, that's too bad. I, if I'm following this correctly, we're about in July now of yes, 1960. Yes. yes, it is. And you're at Cherry Point, North Carolina. Yes. And what is your assignment mm. now? Now uh, I'm really with uh, a, the Second Marine Air Wing, uh, and I was w with a, a, an outfit called VMR 353, which was a uh, uh, a squadron, a, uh, a supply. Uh, it was um, C-119 planes, as I had mentioned. Uh, which was for uh, aircraft, and my position was to obtain parts for aircraft 
uh, to, uh, if, if planes were out of commission, I, my job was to go and uh, get the parts for the planes so that they, they could get back into the air. Okay, uh, stop there a second. Tell us about a C-119 and tell us mm -hmm. at this time in, in world history, what is the United States, United States Marine Corps mm -hmm. doing with these planes? Yeah, uh, really what we were doing is transporting troops uh, uh, to different various bases. Uh, sometimes we would take them even to Air Force bases down to Homestead, Florida, because during that time, uh, a little later on, I think it was probably around 1961 where the Cuban crisis uh, came, uh, started in, and that was with Russia sending ships to Cuba mm -hmm. and, and missiles uh, being uh, set up in Cuba that were uh, aimed at the United States. And our mission there was to uh, uh, send troops down to Homestead Air Force Base in Florida, down to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Uh, we were always sending planes uh, somewhere, uh, different uh, missions uh, to take supplies to, uh, to troops, you know, down at the various, whatever, various bases they would okay. be trying. President Kennedy, was, Jack Kennedy was the President of the United States. Yes. Uh, what did you hear about the Cuban Missile Crisis and, and uh, how did you feel that would affect you in the work you were doing? Uh, I, I didn't know uh, if I would be sent, you know, uh, actually I volunteered to go uh, if uh, need be, you know, to Cuba or wherever I had to be. I, I put in for uh, duty and, uh, and I didn't get chosen. but. I, I did have some friends that did go on uh, the USS Boxer, which uh, ended up down near the Cuban, Cuba and surrounding the island down there. And just uh, uh, there was actually um, uh, no fighting actually took place. Uh, Russia backed down from that mm -hmm. whole uh, mission there. They, they were able to, you know, President Kennedy actually, I guess, uh, forced them, you know, forced the Okay, hand. tell us about. Your contact with or exchange with people who were going to Gitmo or going to Florida, and how close they felt they were to uh, the invasion of the island of Cuba. Gee, I, I think that we felt pretty close because we had troops come up from Camp Lejeune, and we had men uh, all over uh, our barracks sleeping on the floor, uh, sleeping in the hangar. Uh, uh, just about every place you could think of came up from Camp Lejeune. Heavy equipment came up from Camp Lejeune, uh, trucks, oil trucks. Uh, uh, the Air Force came in. Uh, we thought our planes were large, and then the Air Force planes came in, and we, and we saw the size of some of those, and we were putting uh, vehicles on there that were uh, going down to uh, Florida, to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Uh, there was all kinds of equipment. Uh, heavy equipment I'm speaking about. And uh, we really thought that there was going to be uh, uh, certainly something going to uh, take place. We, we were on the uh, on standby. You felt war was imminent. With the, it was very close. The invasion yes. of Cuba was Ooh. imminent. Yes, it was very yeah. close. Tell me, uh, mm. Al, um, that close to a situation like that, what did the Corps do to prepare you uh, telling you what was involved. Did, did you have, um, I don't know what to call these, political action meetings where you were told what mm. was happening yes. and why? And yes. did you have access to uh, television broadcasts? Yes. How did you get your news? Yeah. Well, re really through, through television, yes, uh, we heard it on the news a lot. But also uh, the, the squadron, uh, we would have uh, musters. Uh, throughout the day, uh, they would brief us on, uh, you know, where we, where, where our planes were going and so forth. Uh, and so uh, the higher ups, we had a lieutenant colonel that was in charge of our, our squadron, uh, uh, briefing us on, uh, you know, what was taking place and so forth. Some of these things didn't, we really didn't know almost till. Uh, very close to the time when this all took, you know, the ships from Russia were already heading our way, I think, at the time. And so I don't think we were really briefed until uh, pretty close to, you know, when uh, all this all started happening right away. But uh, they did keep us pretty well posted on what was, you know, what uh, 
things, the way things were progressing. Can you tell us specifically mm -hmm. what you were told? Uh, just uh, my recollection uh, would be that um, I think I was just, you know, just told that, uh, um, you know, that we were definitely on standby, that uh, there's a possibility that we could be shipped out, uh, our unit, and uh, that, uh, and, I, and there again, I wasn't told where we would be going, but I had a good idea, maybe it was down to the Florida area. You would go to Florida or would you go to Guantanamo uh, yeah, itself? Yeah, yes, I think it was one of the... Uh, did you, your, some of your planes go to Guantanamo? Yes, they did. So they went to Cuba? Yeah, they did, John, yes. And did you yes. talk to any of the people who made those runs? Yes, I did, yeah. I Can should. you tell us about their experiences, yeah. what they told you? Uh, well, uh, I think... Uh, uh, I, I know one uh, experience where one of our planes actually had some trouble. We had put a lot of troops on there from Camp Lejeune, and, and one of our planes uh, developed a hydraulic leak, and they, they no sooner had taken off from uh, Cherry Point, came around, turned right around, came right back, and they were, all the men were all soaking with hydraulic fluid. They were all coming off the plane, so we had to send out another plane right away, and because I was off and running, getting parts for the plane to get it back up into the air, but, but um, I think that um, the experience, it was, um, you, know, uh, you know, being uh, pretty close to uh, war at the time, but uh, as I say, we were, I think we were pretty well, um, you know, uh, at that age, I guess you, you, you don't seem to have too much fear, you know, I mean, it's still you're a little scared, but I think, you, you know, you, you do volunteer for things to do, and I, I volunteered to go if, wherever I had to go. I would have. Uh, but, okay, uh, it's in, in in my head, and I'm not sure of this. Uh, the Cuban crisis was sometime October, maybe. I think it was late somewhere. in the fall, and you had arrived yes. in mm. Cherry Point in July. Yes. Cherry Point in July is a very hot place to be. It's out on the coast, and yes. there's. Uh, Mm. Not much to do. You go into New Bern and that's about it. Yes, it is. Um, what did mm. you do? What specifically was your job there? Uh, I was really uh, um, in charge of uh, getting all the supplies for the plane, like, uh, in other words, uh, parts, I should say, for the planes uh, uh, that were out of commission. Uh, I would go, uh, say, I would be told uh, by, say, the, our engineering department and the squadron or, or uh, the metal department, you know, sheet metal department, uh, they would need certain things for the plane, pumps and things like this here, so they would come up to us with a uh, requisition and uh, we would go ahead and take that and we would go down over to another hangar, not another hangar, but excuse me, to a, another supply building uh, which was like a wing supply, and we would ask to see if they had the part there. If it wasn't there, they would send us to Navy Supply, which is another larger building on the base. And if they couldn't get it there, then they would go off base, and uh, we would have to wait till that part came in. So in the meantime, the plane would be just sitting there, you know, uh, not too much we could do till we get that part in. Uh, once we get the part in, we would get, get a call uh, from whoever it would be on the base there, saying that usually it was Navy Supply. And, uh, Are you saying Navy Supply? Yes, it was. It was called Navy Supply. It was a real large building, yeah. and it was called Navy Supply. And uh, we would go down and pick up that, uh, that part. Now, depending on the size of the part, we would have to, have to go to the motor pool to get the type of vehicle we would need to get it. I drove a lot of different types of forklifts. Uh, in one case, we needed a wing for a plane that had uh, crashed down in Guantanamo Bay, actually. A whole wing? Yes, a whole wing. And you uh, order it up like a spark plug? Yeah, it, really? yes, we did. Yes, yeah, it was all crated. And we would have to, uh, we had li real large forklifts that I drove, and we would go actually go pick it up and bring it right to another plane to take to fly down to to uh, wherever it had to, had to go. And so that was my job. Uh, I could drive a lot of different types of vehicles. If it, really anything real, real large, like a semi, you know, an 18-wheeler type truck or something like that, uh, those I, did, I didn't have a license to drive that size. But I did drive six fives, yeah. uh, uh, weapons carriers. You uh, were in VMR 53. Th yes, 353. 353. Yes, it was. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. How many planes did you have in your squadron? Oh boy. Mm. How many of these giant? Planes yes. were in your squadron. Mm, 
I, I'm kind of guessing. I would say that. six, eight, twelve, yeah, fifteen. I, I, I think it probably maybe a dozen planes. A dozen of yeah. these things. That's a lot mm, of hardware to keep yes. track of, isn't it? Yes. Mm. And were there any other types of planes in your squad? No, no, it was strictly that type of plane, yeah. Were there well, fighter planes on your, yes. at, at Cherry Point? Yes, there were. Corsairs, 6Fs, yeah. There things There was like a that. lot of uh, Phantom F4s, Phantoms, yeah. uh, that came in there. We had a squadrons of those. Uh, uh, I don't know a lot of, about planes, but uh, there was a lot of other type of planes that came in there, two Navy planes were there. In the, um, although, uh, although most of them uh, uh, were, you know, the Marine Corps, of course, as I say, like the Phantom um, and the, uh, Were they all jets? Yes, they were, yes. Including these 119s? Two, yes, yeah. And those were all prop, prop planes. Those were props. Yes, they were, yeah. yeah. They were giant. What was your rank by this time, Yes. Al? I think maybe I may have been like a, um, a, a either a private first class or lance corporal at that time. You told me you got to be a, yes. a corporal at a pretty early age. Yeah, yes. Some I, guys I, are in the Corps 20 yes. years before they get two stripes. Yeah, yes, yeah. I, I advanced fairly uh, rapidly. How come? Uh, I, I don't know. I guess uh, we had um, in our, our supply area. I think it was we had a, a warrant officer that was in charge. We had a gunnery sergeant that came under him, and we had uh, I believe it was two sergeants, and we had um, I think it was three other men, myself and two other men, that were uh, like private first class, and uh, there was room for advancement up to up to corporal. So uh, as time went on, I advanced to lance corporal and then to corporal. So I think I was about, uh, just about 18, maybe when I, I finally made corporal. Well, that's good for you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. You hadn't been in the Corps that long. Uh, this, we're talking about October of 61, yes. is that correct? Y yes. Um, mm. And you're in a crisis, really, a uh, situation that uh, mm. we could go to war, or at least the invasion of Cuba or war with Russia on a larger scale. Can you go back enough years to think about uh, how you felt and the guys around you felt about this? Mm -hmm. From a pretty good job uh, at Cherry Point, you guys are on the mm -hmm. brink of something pretty big. Yes. Can you tell us how that felt? Well, uh, you know, we were very close. We were a close group of, uh, of men there that, uh, uh, you know, we trained uh, uh, you know, our training, you know, through uh, all our training all the way along, it, it was geared to uh, going into combat or war. And so I think we all felt uh, uh, that we were capable of uh, whatever we needed to do. I don't think anybody would back down at all. Uh, uh, it, was, it was actually, I think, uh, uh, you know, we uh, accepted the uh, that position that uh, you know, whatever it took, we would do, and uh, I think everybody felt that that um, closeness about uh, helping one another. Mm. Uh, we were very close. I had an awful lot of friends that, and I still do to, even today. But but uh, I think at that time we were a very close unit, and uh, I think it really just developed by training with one another. You know, uh, living close closely together. I lived in the barracks all the time. I was uh, in the service and. And uh, as I say, as I advanced, you know, I had to tell other men what to do, and, and uh, you know, and we were also uh, throughout uh, the, the squadron I was in was very, uh, very gun ho outfit. Uh, we trained every day with physical fitness. Uh, every morning we would go outside, march, uh, and we would have to qualify each year, you know, in the rifle range. And uh, we did a lot of physical fitness PT. Uh, um, every single day we did that. And even at noontime, we would, uh, uh, there was a certain time period that we would run, um, you know, some, uh, uh, you know, do uh, so many miles of running and that type of thing. And then, of course, we had all types of inspections, naturally. Uh, sure. But was there a rifle range at Cherry Point? Yeah, yes. So uh, did, uh, this is, you, you haven't been in the Corps a, a year yet, um, yes. but did they say, you guys better uh, review a lot of the stuff you did at uh, either PI or Camp Lejeune, mm. your infantry tactics, mm. uh, in addition to your aviation work now. Yes. 
were you getting more rehearsals about how to fire that Garand? Yeah, yes, yeah. So we, they took you back up to the rifle range. We did a lot of that. Yes, we yeah. did, John. Uh, too. Yes, we did. In in the we we uh, um, also trained with other types of weapons too. You know, uh, we had rocket launches that we practiced with, uh, uh, um, and I think there was some other type of. Uh, uh, I, don't know, I think they were called like a grease gun. They were actually a type of a machine gun. And Browning automatic rifles were another type of weapon that we trained with too. Uh, rocket launches, uh, various types of weapons, of course. And we had also trained with that at Camp Lejeune too, mm -hmm. before we got to Cherry Point. Did you guys think it through to the extent that you didn't know if you would be fighting uh, Cubans or Russians? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if we really, uh, really realized who we would our um, enemy was going to be. We, I think we thought probably Russia, but you know, in Cuba perhaps. But, but um, I think we th thought in terms of Russia more than we did probably of Cuba because that seemed to be where the uh, the, the ships were coming in from. You know, mm -hmm. so I think we were looking at that more so perhaps. Um, You're in, uh, still in the Carolinas, and you've mm. been through a summer there, and you're getting into your uh, second winter in the Corps. Were you clothed properly? Were you wearing uh, mm. clothes not too light, not too heavy, but yes, properly equipped for the uh, climate you were in? Y yes, yes, we were, John. Yeah, we were, we were issued um, uh, different types of uh, clothing, such as uh, utility, Type, uh, they're almost like a dungaree material. I used to call, we used to call them utility uh, tri trousers, you know. And uh, they were, uh, that was our uniform of the day, that mostly because we would be always working in warehouses. I worked a lot of warehouses that uh, we, were, we kept all of these supplies. Um, and um, of course, the uniforms, uh, you know, our dress uniform would be uh, greens. Uh, during the winter, of course, and they would they would come in a certain time of year. You would have to change over to your, your greens or your. We also had a, um, I guess it was sort of a gabardine type uh, uniform that we would wear throughout the summer months. Your khakis. Uh, yeah, more yeah. khakis. Yes, they were. Before this yes. interview, you showed me a picture of you mm -hmm. in uh, dress blues. Yes. How did that come about? Uh, where did you get the dress blues? Yeah, you know, it was it was really a, a fellow that was uh, leaving uh, and uh, had been uh, discharged from the Marines, and he didn't take his dress blues with him, and and I guess he uh, didn't think he was going to need them, so uh, he, he gave them to me, and that's how I got them. <laughs> he was from uh, California, actually, out uh, Oregon, and yeah. uh, that's kind of how I obtained that, and they fit me all right, so I think I had a some, some tailoring done, but they fit me okay, and I. Yeah, you look great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How would you? You mentioned before that uh, the officer in charge of your unit was a warrant officer. Yes. Um, how would you weigh at this distance the quality of the leadership you got? Gee, I, I think it was very good. It was very from him or other officers in yes. your unit. Uh, we got a lot of support from the uh, higher ups uh, uh, throughout throughout our unit. Uh, uh, we, as I say, the gunnery side it was uh, there day to day, and also the warrant officer usually would come in quite a bit too. Uh, but uh, and they would. Uh, um, I couldn't tell you exactly all their their duties, but. But they would oversee what we had to do. We had uh, we were in charge of all the equipment for all the pilots of the planes, getting the all their um, flight gear, uh, uh, flight suits. Uh, we had to make up packets so that they could uh, obtain gasoline at various bases for our planes when they landed, and they needed gasoline for refueling our planes. They had to have certain vouchers made up so that they could uh, get that voucher and and uh, you know, get the uh, fuel for the plane. When they came back to Cherry Point, they would turn all that paperwork in to us. We would have to take that paperwork and submit it to Fleet Aviation. A county office in Virginia we would all have to be sent up there for processing and so forth. So, so not only did we do, um, you know, out in uh, being in warehouse work and 
taking care of the barracks, all the uh, linens for the for the troops in the barracks and uh, and weaponry. Uh, we were in charge of all the armory for the barracks as well. We we ended up doing a lot of paperwork too as well. So there was some accounting involved, and I guess that's kind of where I got my experience as, as I came out of the service to kind of go on to become. Uh, uh, you know, into that type yeah, of field. That, that's interesting. <laughs> One of these things takes off, a C-119 takes off from Cherry Point yes. and is going to Guantanamo and back. And when it comes back, you get a briefcase full of papers uh, for expenditure for gasoline, yes. um, oil, equipment for the plane. So what about mm. food and... Uh, the checking into mess halls on other bases was that all part of your uh, what you had to do? No, not it wasn't. Uh, most of the, most of the food that we we supply we supply the crew with with uh, food enough uh, for uh, they were almost like box lunches. Yeah. And we, we would we would go out on the flight deck uh, in a in a jeep, and uh, if we knew there was you know four or five uh, crew. Uh, that were going to be on that plane, we would make sure that they had enough food on there to get to wherever their, their destination was going to be. Okay. From that point on, then wherever they were, you know, at they would they would get the supplies, the, the needed supplies. Come this Cuban Missile Crisis, as it came to be called, what mm -hmm. kind of hours were you working? Uh, uh, pretty stringent. A lot of traffic going in and out of your base? Yes, uh, we were on duty, on, we were uh, actually on standby uh, seven days a week. I mean, there was no, no really let up uh, during that time. I mean, we were, we could, uh, we could go, you know, to the movies. We could stay on the base. I don't believe that they wanted you going off the base, but, but we could go to the base and we could go to the movies, you know, that kind of thing. But you had to always check out with the officer of the day or, or yeah. the, um, at the barracks, you know. Uh, say the sergeant that was on duty at the barracks, you would have to let them know where you were going to be at all times. Yes. But you guys were working pretty hard. Yes. And uh, were you part of mm -hmm. any, uh, the, the crews that loaded stuff on planes? If they carried uh, 50,000 pounds of stuff, who was in charge of yes. loading all that? Uh, uh, well, uh, I, I don't recall that. Um, uh, we had people that were, uh, you know, uh, troops that were, uh, would help us, you know, get that on board. I mean, we were responsible for getting that part to the, to the plane. Usually we, we did a lot of this right in the hangar because we could, we could, it would hold, the hangar would actually hold two aircraft in the hangar. So uh, a lot of that could be loaded on right there before we even got, you know, had it sitting yeah. on the flight line out there. But. But uh, most of that would be brought in by forklift, and we we did some of that. Yes, we did, and and, uh, and then other uh, departments would help too as well. If, if it was engineering and so forth, uh, we would have troops, you know, helping like that. Yes. You you said you had about a dozen planes in your squadron. When one mm -hmm. of these breaks down or loses a wing in Guantanamo, mm -hmm. uh, what did this do to your uh, cycle of getting these planes in and out of? the hangar and into mm -hmm. the air where they belong. Well, Did that uh, really screw you up? Y yes. Uh, well, it, do it does. Uh, uh, it depends on how the need for that particular plane uh, uh, and, and the, the voucher that would come through from whatever department that needed that particular part, if it was, uh, it would be, uh, it would, um, I don't recall the exact terms, but it would be an urgent type of voucher, or it would be an immediate, you know, uh, uh, type voucher that you would have. They would need that pot immediate, you know, uh, as soon as possible, you know. And there was certain uh, terminology. I don't recall the exact terminology, but uh, you know, to get that particular pot as quick as we possibly could. And so we would put out a, uh, uh, you know, uh, a certain type of uh, um, bulletin, you know, so that we could get that that particular pot as, as quickly quick as, as we possible. Could. Yeah, we could. Yeah. That plane couldn't be down for uh, very long. You know, they wanted that back up as quick as we could get it. Yes. I just thought of, of a question maybe I should ask you. Were you aware of the fact that as you got into the fall of that year and the President of the United mm -hmm. States gets up and says, you know, we're eyeball to eyeball uh, with mm -hmm. Nikita Khrushchev, 
Um, were they beginning to call back reserve guys, uh, people not in the general cycle you were in in the Corps, but did they call mm -hmm. up reserves? I don't recall that they did uh, at that time, John. I think uh, I do. All I recall is that uh, we had troops coming up from Camp Lejeune uh, immediately, and, and they were arriving at our base at Cherry Point, and uh, and we had them, as I say, in all not only our squadron, but many of the squadrons on the base. There was uh, I couldn't even tell you how many squadrons were at Cherry Point, but. All throughout the base were uh, troops from Camp Lejeune, uh, all ready to be shipped out to wherever they had to go. How about uh, technical people, mm -hmm. people like you? Yes. Uh, mechanics, uh, aircraft mechanics, ordnance yes. men. Yes. Uh, w did you have enough mm -hmm. of them? Yes. W yes, we did. Uh, I think uh, if we didn't have them at Cherry Point, we would they would bring them in from other bases. Yes, they did. And because uh, we weren't too far from. Uh, from uh, New River, which was the uh, you know uh, helicopter base, uh, which supported uh, uh, on each coast. Usually, you have your you have your uh, air, air squadron, you know your Second Marine Air Wing. Then you have Camp Lejeune, which is the ground troops, and you usually have had at that time another base, which was your helicopters uh, base, which was uh, New River, and that was all within about 40 miles of each other. So those planes get a, that type of, uh, you, know, you would have uh, sufficient people to draw on, you know, for what you needed, depending on your needs, yes. Mm. Are, I'm, I'm not sure at, at your level you would have been aware of this or maybe just noticed it, but what about li your liaison with the West Coast and all the Marine Corps power mm. out on the West Coast? Was that feeding mm. through you guys or directly down to Florida? Do you know uh, how that worked? I, I don't offhand, like uh, I'm thinking of El Toro, California was a big, uh, another air station out there. In Miramar was, uh, to, yes. yeah. And, and I don't know for sure, no I don't, John, how that worked. I'm sure they were on standby too, just like we would be too, but uh, us being a little closer, of course, we, were, we would uh, probably, um, uh, naturally we, we would be sent first right away, but but I'm sure they weren't stand by it too. I'm, I know yeah. they would be, yes they would. You mentioned yeah. getting home for a mm -hmm. month somewhere in there. Yes. Um, did you discuss with your family what, what you were doing and mm. were they concerned at the time all of this broke out? Mm. You could make long distance calls or whatever. Yes. Can you tell us about the, the home front reaction to your being in the core on the brink of something pretty big. Mm. Well, yes, I, I think my folks were uh, very concerned about what's going on because uh, uh, we were always so close. But uh, uh, I think they felt, you know, that uh, I would reassure them that things were going well. Uh, maybe, maybe sometimes you would tell a few, uh, a little bit of a white lie there. But uh, usually things were going pretty well. Uh, we couldn't say a whole lot. You, you couldn't. Uh, they didn't want you to say too much about some of the things that were taking place. But in my letters to my folks, I wrote all the time. Uh, I would say, you know, that uh, this is kind of what's happening and so forth. And and uh, I, I kind of let that go that way. But yes, my folks were very concerned, and and uh, they came down a couple of times. They came down to visit, actually, down at Cherry Point too. Did they really? Yes, they did. Yeah. On that's vac that's uh, nice. On vacation, yeah. yes. By any chance, mm. do your letters uh, still survive? You know, I, I think the, my mother has a couple of my letters. I'd have to look and see. I think she does somewhere. They, yes, I'm sure she does. Uh, she's moved from her home in Waltham to my sister's house, so I don't know where those are at the moment, but yes, there were some letters, yes. If you could dig those mm. out, we'd like to see those. Yes. Uh, those are historical documents yeah. and talking about a time which was mm. uh, very crucial to the United States and uh, very dicey at the time. Mm. You lived through it, so you know. Yes, I'd be more than glad to try to see if I could obtain those too, John. You haven't mentioned your friend. Um, let's see, what was his name? Yes, it was. It was Malvin. A, yeah, yes, it was a fellow named Where is he all this time? Uh, Melvin Brock. Well, he was uh, actually with a different squad, and he was with a MAG outfit, which was pretty much on the go. That was a, uh, a Marine Air Group yeah. squadron. 
uh, and he was, um, I, I, I think, uh, uh, I'm not certain, to be honest with you, we, we did lose contact al along the way because he was on his, you know, uh, with a different outfit. And so uh, he ended up going over to Japan, and after that we kind of parted. You know, in a I group or was he in a carrier? To, to, uh, uh, um, I don't know if uh, he it was still a, a squadron, you know, a MAG outfit, uh, the Marine Air Group outfit that he was with, but. But uh, I don't know. Uh, they, I do know that they went over to Japan. And okay. I, I, I'm not sure, John. Just wondered if you kept in touch. Yeah. No, we kind of drifted our own way. Yes, we did. <laughs> what did you do after the Cuban Missile Crisis? Mm. And you've got uh, three more years to serve in the Corps. Mm. What did you do? Well, you know, it was pretty much the same thing all the time. I mean, we continued to. Uh, uh, you know, always uh, have, have uh, to uh, bring in supplies for planes. You know, it was, uh, I think, uh, um, uh, as I say, we were always seen to be on the go somewhere. Uh, I, I don't know if, uh, I couldn't tell you where always our planes were going because that was sort of out of operations area. There was a, a department yeah, called operations. Sure. So I don't know where they all went to. I, sometimes they would go to Memphis, Tennessee, or different places. Uh, but uh, uh, we continued to, uh, you know, supply all the troops with, um, you know, clothing, uh, weapon weapons, um, you know, as I say, all the linens that they needed for the, you know, sleeping and and um, that type of thing, and uh, that that pretty much continued right out right for three years. Out, yeah, for the next three, three years. Yes, it did. Did you personally fly? Mm. Sometimes uh, get in one of these things. Yes, I did. Yes. Did you get flight pay? Uh, no, no, I never got flight pay. But I, I, tra I just went on more of a Liberty Hops type thing. Okay, you needed uh, four hours yes. a, a month for flight pay, I think. To yes, I, I think I don't know how that worked because I never received that. But you but, took a hop occasionally. Yeah. Yeah, yes, where I did. did. Where did you yes, go? Yes, I went down to uh, Miami at one time and. And then I uh, came up to PZ Air Force Base. I was able to get home on a long uh, flight, you know, Good for uh, you. a four-day type uh, uh, pass. Uh, and we came into PZ Air Force Base. We had a difficult time getting in there. That was kind of a, 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 a difficult trip because we ran into very uh, severe weather. And uh, we had a uh, lieutenant colonel that was flying the plane and, and another, um, and I think uh, another, um, that was, I believe, either a lieutenant or a captain that was on the plane, too. By the time we came up the coast and we had landed at Floyd Bennett Field in New York, we had left, let off uh, so many uh, men to visit, you know, in that area, uh, Philadelphia, New York area, and then we flew up, and I think we only had maybe four or five was still on the plane. Uh, uh, as, as well as the, uh, the crew. The and it got plane. pretty hairy because of the weather. Trying to get, trying yeah. to get in, yes. Yeah, we had a tough time. It took us about three times to get in. And I called my folks from Floyd Bennett Field in New York, just telling, telling them that I, w I was on my way and they were going to meet me at uh, Pease Air Force Base. And, and I thought we'd be up there in so many hours. And, and of course, uh, Alston was starting to try to land. and. I, I, it was pitch black, and I looked out, and I could see lightning. And next thing I could see that we were over trees. And next thing we were going back up again. And, and finally, the third time we tried going down, uh, the uh, the uh, captain on the plane came back and said, "We're going to make one more attempt. If we can't, we're going to Burlington, Vermont." And that was out of the range of the storm. So, so we were able to get down the third time. Oh, we did land. Yeah, we were all right. <laughs> So, your four years are up, um, and the Marine Corps said, are you going to ship over? And why didn't you? Yes. Well, you know, I, I, um, I guess really I was looking forward to being, getting out uh, to do something different. I, I, You're 22 years old now? Uh, yes, I was, yeah. Okay. I was, uh, yes. And, and I think that uh, I might have stayed in, because uh, I had a lot of friends that did stay in, uh, but I, I think at the time I, where I hadn't had the experience of traveling too much, I, I think I was disappointed a little bit in, in mm -hmm. the, not being able to travel. I put in for Japan uh, once anyway to go over to Japan. Uh, I put in for, you know, as I say, 
uh, other uh, areas to go up to uh, to get into communications, which which fell through kind of at the last minute, and so. Um, I think I, I was a little bit disappointed because of that. At that uh, time, were, yes. was the Corps looking for guys to stay in? Did yeah, they yes. offer you yes, they uh, did. incentives like going to Japan if you signed yes, up? Yes, yes, they yeah. And you said, no, I'm going yes, home. Yes, yeah, they did. Uh, it was, the, the Vietnam has started already, uh, actually it had already begun, and I think that's where, really where I was heading for. Not that I wouldn't have gone at all. If I had stayed in, I would have welcomed that. Sometimes I feel a little um, guilty about that because I had a lot of very close friends that went over there and, uh, and uh, some didn't come back. Um, so I feel a little guilty about that, but... Um, Wait a minute, say that again. Yes. You had friends yes. in the Corps yes. who went to Vietnam? Yes, they did, John. How, yes. how did that yeah. come about? The, well, uh, they had they had almost uh, served out there four years of uh, service, you know, at that time, and then they were shipping a lot of troops over to Vietnam, and so I had a very good friend from Newton. I, when we when we joined uh, all of us together, I I didn't know these fellows at all, but when we we get down to Ch uh, to Paris Island, we became pretty good friends. We found out there was five fellows from Newton that had joined at the same time. And on the train going down, the, the troop train going down to Paris Island, we became kind of close friends. Yes. The, the five of us from Newton and the two from Waltham. And because Waltham and Newton were great rivals in football, so we, we had uh, something in common there. You but stayed in touch with them for the yeah. four years? Yes, I did. Yeah. And then you heard they were going yes. to NAM? Yes, I did. Tell us about that, yeah. how you heard it. And yes. Well, I, I knew that uh, uh, one fellow, uh, his name was Rico Pignano from Newton, was going over there, and he was, in, uh, he was actually stationed at um, Camp Lejeune, so I... So he was infantry? Yes, he was in infantry, yes he was. And he had to do with uh, uh, trying to, uh, to do with mines, to uh, uh, disassemble mines and that type of thing. Uh, yeah, I don't know what, what exactly what you call that, but anyway, uh, um, he uh, unfortunately uh, um, was uh, a mine did explode and was killed that way, and so um, this was after I had got out of the service, and, and shortly thereafter he had was killed over there, and and he was engaged to be married, and so we went, all of us went to his funeral in Newton, and all all of us from uh, Waltham and uh, and uh, the other four fellows from Newton all went. And it was pretty sad because, uh, uh, as I say, even though I didn't know him, we kind of went our own way because he was stationed at a different base, but, but still we were pretty close and so we went. And, uh, and his father uh, asked us all to come into the kitchen and um, he said to, you know, he seemed to want us to be with us more so than he did with his own family. He wanted to know what his son had done in the Marines you know, and this type of thing. So we sat in the kitchen talking to him about that. It was very difficult and it was a, a hard time. Um, but I, I guess that's kind of why I felt a little bit guilty about uh, maybe not serving over there because I did have another good friend that went over too, but he came back, he did two tours over there. He came out a master sergeant and he did 10 years in the, in the Marines and I still keep in touch with him. He's from Sparta, Tennessee, and his name is Jerry Clark, and a very good friend. He and I were on the judo team at Paris Island together, and we got to go to the All-Marine Judo Tournament at Paris Island. Uh, over the years, we, we uh, 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 competed with all the Marine bases from all over the, uh, all over the United States. And they came from 29 Palms, California, from uh, Camp Pendleton, uh, all the different bases, so I got to c compete against a lot of different people, and it was really interesting. But uh, Jerry's been, uh, uh, we've been close friends, we've, uh, we always send Christmas cards and write, you know, and uh, unfortunately I haven't been able to get down, he lives on a farm in spot of Tennessee. <laughs> oh good, yes. uh, can I back up a second here? Yes, John. Can I ask you a kind of personal question here? After all this time that's elapsed since you sat in the kitchen with that man's father. Do you still feel guilty about not having gone to Vietnam? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I, I do. Yes, I do. I, I think I still feel that, um, you know, uh, maybe I guess I felt that that was part of my job to, uh, to um, I was trained to go, you know, far combat. And I guess maybe I felt that by, by getting out, uh, even though I wasn't really aware where I was going to be stationed after four years, if I would go over to Vietnam, but my chances were pretty good that I was going to go over there. Uh, I wasn't really aware of that at the time when I did get out. I think I was just happy to be out, you know, and looking forward to uh, yeah. doing something different. But I still, in the back of my mind, did feel a little guilty about mm -hmm. not, uh, not, uh, you know, where we lost so many men over there. I, I often think that, you know, I, sh I felt that I should maybe should have been part of that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll never know. Yes. Let me ask you, Al, uh, was there a most memorable experience of your entire career mm. in the Corps? Well, One thing that pops out all the time. Yes, there is. It's, it's probably a little bit uh, comical in a way. Excuse me, just one moment. Sure. Please. Help yourself. Mm -hmm. It was really at uh, Cherry Point. I was uh, uh, probably, I think I was either a private first class or a Lance Corporal at the time, and, and we had what they call duty driver, which was you had to spend a weekend in the hangar and you lived right in the hangar and, and the officer of the day would be there. Usually it was a second lieutenant or a first lieutenant that would be on duty. And um, we would get, you know, box lunches for the flight crew still and I would drive a Jeep and, and go out on the flight line and get make sure that the, the pilots and so forth had their supplies and that type of thing. But at the same time, we slept in the, in the operations area of the hangar. Mm -hmm. This was a regular, like an office type um, uh, structure. And anyway, I uh, was on duty there and uh, uh, he was going, it was about five o'clock in the evening and he was going to chow. He lived off base, uh, this uh, second lieutenant. And he said to me, uh, 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 you know, uh, I, as I, I don't recall when I was a private first class or not, but he said, private first class, uh, uh, Webb, I want you to take this list of names, which is probably about 20 names on a sheet, and he said, I want you to call everyone on this list here and tell them that Plan 2-60 has gone into effect. And when you finish Are that you list... Are you going to tell us what 2-60 is? Yes. Well, okay. what, what it was was really uh, was a command from the... Um, from our squadron, you know, from the, the lieutenant colonel, but I got that notice from from the base uh, command saying Plan 2-60. That was an emergency situation where where all the planes were would fly out of there to wherever we had to go, and so uh, I didn't realize this, but uh, what it all entailed. But anyway, uh, when he I started to make, and he went to Chow to his home off base. He said, I want you to call all these people. So I started to call, and I had a phone right there, and I'm sitting at a desk, and I started calling, and I'm getting, you know, uh, crew chiefs, and I'm getting uh, uh, some pi pilots, of course, and, and other type of people that would, you know, uh, be on the aircraft, you know, to fly the aircraft. And so I went through this whole list of names calling these people, and so by the time I get to the last name on the list, I went back and started to recall again, and I'm saying, and I'm now I'm getting everybody's wives, and um, they're saying, oh yes, he's on his way, and I said, well, uh, I'm just calling back to confirm that 2-60 is in effect, and oh yes, he's on his way. So I'm, now I'm getting a little bit worried, you know, I'm saying, gee, I hope we get this right. So he, he, explain, <laughs> he didn't explain the whole thing to me, you know, when he had gone, the, uh, the second lieutenant. But anyway, uh, so uh, within about uh, 20 minutes to half an hour, people were coming in with suitcases. Uh, uh, the whole place was buzzing in that, that office there. And uh, they wanted to know what was going on. Uh, they were all set to get onto the planes. And, and, and I said, well, all I know is, you know, what I've been told. And so, because uh, he came back from, you know, from his home, from uh, Chow there, and, and uh, his face nearly turned white as a ghost. And, uh, you know, I explained that, you know, I called, you know, and, and so anyway, the, the lieutenant colonel showed up of our outfit, and uh, the next morning we were told, you know, to report to his office immediately in the morning at 0800 uh, to be uh, standing tall in front of him at that time, the both of us. So we went in, and, 
And, and I can remember sitting in op that operations office, even be prior to 0800, in that morning, sitting there just waiting for that meeting. And I'm saying, boy, I'm, I know I'm going to lose a stripe over this, you know. And he, and he was worried too, of course. And, and he didn't say anything to me at all. And we were both went in. And, and, uh, and all of a sudden, the lieutenant uh, colonel said to me, he said, uh, you know, Pirate First Class Webby said, I, I just want to tell you, you know, that, you know, from now on, this is what this all means and so forth. But, but uh, he, I was excused, and then I guess he, he went up one side and down the other side of this lieutenant, uh, you know, uh, for not instructing me properly on what this whole thing meant. But he said at the same time to me when I was in there that it was a great exercise and, and he was very proud that uh, all of, everybody showed up on time and, and it was a great exercise. So, <laughs> so all my friends uh, still kid me today about that whole experience and we had quite a time. Uh, I didn't have that duty driver for months after that and so things went along for four or five months and I didn't have that at all. And the next time I got that duty, that same lieutenant was on duty. And so uh, anyway, before he went to, you know, chow at five o'clock that evening, uh, uh, anyway, uh, he said to me, he said, I'm going to go over this plan 2-60 again with you, you know. And so I said, I think I'm pretty sure I understand what's, what, you know. He said, it's only if you get a, if we, if you get a phone call from the, the lieutenant colonel, uh, you know, from the squad on command, that this has gone into effect, then you call these people, but not a, don't, don't call anybody unless you're here, here directly from somebody like that. So uh, myself, so, so anyway, I said, no, I understood. So he said, and he said, and anything else happens, you let me know. So I was sitting there and, and I was looking out the window out, out in the flight line and there's, we had a um, place where we washed the planes and it was a, a Quonset hut out there. And so a lot of planes would be washed out there, John. And so I'm looking out there, and sure enough, there was a fire in the Quonset going on the side of the Quonset, all, all in flames out there. I don't know it was an oil fire or what it was. And I'm looking out, and I said, oh my goodness, that's on fire. So anyway, I get on the phone and I called that lieutenant at his home, and I said, you know, Lieutenant so and so, I said, this is our first class web calling. I said, and I said, and there's uh, out on the flight line, out at the on the Quonset hut there, there's a fire going right now. And I said, so, and, and the crash crew trucks hadn't arrived yet or anything. So he said, uh, he said, I'm on my way in. And he said, and that thing better be burning when I get in there. He said to me like that. And I said, I, I hope it is. <laughs> I'll start another one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that, that, that was kind of a, uh, uh, I guess one of, one of the experiences I'll never forget. No, you won't. Yeah. <laughs> when and where were you discharged? Uh, I was discharged from Cherry Point, North Carolina, on January 30th, 1964. They held you four years, didn't yes, they? they? Did. And with yes. what rank did you yes. have at that time? I, I was a corporal. Corporal yes, uh, E4. Any yes. specific decorations that you had? I, I, the only decoration I had, John, was uh, the Medal of Good Conduct, which is. So you were a good guy for four years. Yes, I tried yeah. to be. Yes, I sure did. Yeah. <laughs> did you join any reserve unit? After you came um, home, I was in the inactive reserve yeah. uh, because at that time you had to serve two years inactive uh, reserve time. So I was really discharged, and I think it was in December of '65 was my actual discharge date from the military. But because uh, I had actually, I actually I had really kind of signed up about a month in December uh, of actually 1959. I went in 1960, uh, January of 1960, but. I really signed up about a month mm -hmm. before that, and so my actual uh, six years were really up in December of 1960. So it's four years active duty two. and two inactive. Yes, it was. Yeah, it was right. And did you join any veterans organizations when you came home? I no, I didn't. It, why, no. why not, Al? Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. I guess uh, I don't know. To be honest with you, I guess I I started working. I worked for a bank and. Uh, and so I, um, I think I just got busy. I, I went to school nights uh, under the GI Bill, and I, I was going to Burdett College in Boston, and I went in there. Uh, and so I think I just didn't have the, really the time to do too much. I started right in right away. I, within just after I came out in January um, of, that, of 1964, I, I just started working mm -hmm. within 
just a couple months after that, I got a job with a bank and I started right in. You had things to do, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yes. I think, I think those organizations are wonderful, though, they do. Uh, we did have uh, the uh, USO came to our base. We had Lionel Richie came to Cherry Point and uh, perform for us. We did have people like that that did come to the base. Oh, that, that's yes. lucky for you. Yes. What kind nice. of reception did you get when you came home? Uh, you had been, not in wartime, but you had been through the Cuban Missile Crisis. Did you talk with your mm. family or um, f mm. others about what you had done in the Corps? Yeah, yeah I, I, yes I did. I, I spoke to my folks, uh, you know, and told them a lot of things that had taken place. Uh, you know, they wanted to know, because uh, they had, we, I was fortunate to, where I was stationed in the United States and on the East Coast, I was able to get home every, every year pretty much for Christmas. I always took my leave at Christmas time, so I was able to get home so I could tell them what was going on at that time. So they had a pretty good idea, but still I was able to kind of fill them in on a lot of different things that take place. Mostly probably uh, about my friends, you know, where they were going and so forth like that, and uh, what I had done and so forth. Uh, uh, as I say, I wrote a lot too. I, I was one to write letters a lot, so so I think I, I think they had a pretty good idea what that's, I was doing. That's good, and don't yes. forget to hang on yes. to those letters. Can you think or tell us about how important to you was serving in the military in the United States Marine Corps? Well, I, I, I feel very proud that I did serve uh, for my country, and, and uh, if I had to do it over again, I'd do the same thing today, I think. Uh, I, as I say, uh, I, maybe the only disappointment was not being able to travel a little bit more, maybe going overseas, that type of thing, John. But I, do, I feel very strongly that, that it was a wonderful experience. Uh, I think, you know, not everybody's cut out to go right into college, and at that time, I think at those, in those years, uh, people didn't have the money. I know my folks didn't have the money to send me to college, so, so and I, I didn't play sports at that time until I got in the Marine Corps. I played football and judo, but, but I didn't have the money to go to college, so I didn't really know other than maybe just working. I had worked with Sher Sherwin Williams Paint Company before I went in, and maybe that's why I ended up in supply, because I told them that I had I used to uh, stock the shelves for Sherwin Williams, and the next thing I knew, I was in supply. So I don't know. <laughs> but you used your uh, yeah. GI Bill. Yes, I did. Uh, to get your yeah. college yeah. education. I did. Yes, I did. That yeah. would entitle yes. you to what? Six years of college. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm not positive on the exact uh, amount of time it did cover, but it did cover a lot of it, and uh, I took advantage of that. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. I. I really went to a lot of different schools. I kind of, even, even at Terry Point, I went to East Carolina College and studied English uh, literature and uh, took some English courses at, at East Good Carolina College when I had time. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. You spoke earlier when we first started this interview about how you felt the uh, serving in the Corps had affected your life. It mm -hmm. gave you uh, a lot of positive attributes. Can you tell us again, quickly, uh, what the core did for you? Well, I, I think it gives you a lot of, uh, gave me a lot of confidence, you know, to, uh, when I went just to, uh, for interviews with, uh, and job interviews, you know, trying to get a job and so forth, I, I think I, I had the confidence that I felt pretty confident about, you know, my abilities, you know, uh, being still pretty young, uh, I think what amazed me too was that um, the, the young, young men that were running, uh, you know, were actually uh, performing all these different types of duties, flying air, aircraft, uh, being in the um, ground forces, you know, and going into combat at young ages. These, these young fellows, uh, you know, uh, uh, just young men. Um, it's amazing what was accomplished at, a, at such a young age, yes. how quickly you can learn, you know, when you really have to. And it, was, it, it always amazed me, you know, to think, gee, a 20-year-old or 18-year-old can do these type of things, you know, and, and protect our country, really. It, it often amazed me at that. But I, I was really, uh, I, I, even today, I'm very proud that I, I served and, I, as I say, 
I, I think I would uh, go back and do it again, just like I did before. <laughs> I'm sure. Good I for you. <laughs> you said a moment ago that uh, mm. you left the Corps just about the time guys were going over to Vietnam. Yes. So you were here mm. when those guys came home. Yes. For those who did. Yes. Uh, could you see? Tell us any distinction mm. you might see in the way men were received who had served in World War II or the Korean mm. War and those who had served in Vietnam, mm. how they were met when they came home? Well, uh, the fella, uh, most of the fellows that I, uh, the uh, other fellows that I went in with, uh, there was only just this one, one fellow from Newton that I knew, you know, as I say, he was killed over there. So I didn't really know um, the other fellow that went over and served two terms of duty with, uh, over in uh, Vietnam and was lived in Tennessee. I didn't really see him return, so I don't know how he was treated at all. I guess we're talking more generically than yeah. anybody yes. that you even read about this in the papers mm. or uh, how men from Vietnam, what kind mm. of reception they got mm. when they came back after that war. Yes. Well, I, th I think it's probably more from my reading in the papers and so forth. How how uh, maybe they were uh, really maybe weren't looked upon maybe uh, as as so much heroes uh, uh, because it was such a uh, controversial type war uh, you know uh, there was so much uh, um, turmoil you know with colleges uh, and so forth uh, you know people uh, protesting the war and mm -hmm. so forth like that so I don't think they were uh, maybe um, you know. Uh, as welcomed, or you know, uh, as as the as the heroes, it's maybe as so much as as uh, perhaps other times. But I'm not sure if that didn't also occur in other wars too. I, I wouldn't know, but uh, you know, from uh, Second World War and so forth too. It probably some of that maybe had taken place too. Maybe they weren't always looked up quite as you know. Um, but that, that war in particular, I guess maybe it was that way. It seemed to be, uh, from what I read anyway, you know, with the different, uh, all the different students, you know, protesting on campuses throughout, um, and the government, you know, the people were questioning whether we should be over there and that type of thing too, John. There was a lot of uh, questions, you know, uh, that arose. Mm. We're getting very close to the end here now, Al. Uh, sure. I'd like to ask you, is there any other thought or incident or one last thing you'd like to tell your family mm. or people who will be looking at this tape a long mm. time from now about your service in the United States mm. Marine Corps? Well, I, I, w I would certainly uh, encourage uh, uh, young people to look to the service as, as a, as a uh, way of uh, uh, making a career, I, I think I don't think we have the people today like we used to have, uh, because I think a lot of uh, young people today are more inclined to go to college, which is which is wonderful. I, I mean, they have that that opportunity so much more today. There's so many more opportunities, but at the same time, uh, I think I think we need to be a strong uh, military, uh, uh, have a strong military presence in, in throughout the world and. Sometimes I question that, you know, the way things are, whether we're still as strong as we used to be. Uh, um, I, I do feel strongly that that's a wonderful start for young people, and I even encourage it with my own son because he was a little bit, um, wasn't sure what he really wanted to do, and I said to him, I said, you know, gee, maybe why don't you sit down with, uh, it didn't have to be the Marine Corps, uh, you know, although he did go to the Marine Corps, uh, uh, you know, uh, to the uh, recruiter and did talk with him and he was very, uh, I thought he might go, but anyway, uh, it didn't have to be the Marines. I said, you know, Air Force, Army, Navy, whatever it would be, you know, it's, it's a wonderful start. It gives you time to, to kind of get your life in order. Um, and also, these days now, uh, I think the military is offering a lot more for the young people, you know, they're paying them a little bit more. They're also offering, you know, uh, college tuition, uh, Things like that, so that when they come out, you know, they'll be eventually in, you know, in the uh, equal to other people. You know, I, I think when I went in, I, I when I first started work and so forth, I found that 
a lot of these people already had degrees from colleges and so forth. So I felt that I was kind of always trailing behind, you know, because I had gone in and I didn't have a college degree. But eventually I was able to go nights and, and get my degree, but, but it took me a lot longer because of that. But I, st I still feel very strong I did the right thing. <laughs> Good for you, Al. Yes. Thank you very much yes, for being Yes, you're welcome, with us John. Tonight. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Very good. Thank we you for your time, it. John. Thank, Thank you. you very much.